Hello everyone, uh, welcome. I got my I Love Excel t-shirt on and I'm very excited. And it's not just because of the t-shirt, it's because in a few minutes I'll be starting an interview with George Mann. We're going to talk about his book, Advancing into Analytics. Now this book is brilliant. I love George because he doesn't take the approach that people usually take, like people that know Python or even people that know Power BI can be very dismissive of Excel and I think that's very very much the wrong approach. I think every single tool has its place and, and George comes to it from exactly that perspective. So he's talking about R and Python in this book for Excel users but in a sense how they complement each other. How where Excel is maybe lacking a simple plot you can get it in R, right? Where descriptive statistics of Excel are not enough, you can go to R, you can go to Python. So this book and the way it's written, because it's all about examples, I think is the best gateway for any Excel user to start learning R and Python. And that's why I decided to do this interview with George and we're going to talk about the book and descriptions for the book and for everything else. George is also doing a online course, I think, and all those descriptions will be listed down below. Enjoy. So tell us a story about George that led up to, you know, advancing into analytics. How did this book come to be? Yeah, thanks for the prop there. I've got mine too. And I started doing Excel probably 10 years ago. I really didn't do a lot of it when I went to college. And I was really surprised when I got into a, an analyst kind of role, how much Excel and how much data I needed to use. And I just was not prepared for it. And I just was asking myself, why, why is this, right? We, we have all these smart people that are uh, pretty well accomplished in different fields, but we're just not doing what we should do with, with data. And kind of set me on a path of, uh, at first just documenting what I learned in Excel that day, because there was always something new I needed to do with, with my data. So it was just a log of, of kind of teaching myself what, what I've done. And from there, um, I've always had an interest in uh, statistics and, and modeling and things like that. I wouldn't call myself really uh, good at math, but I, I've enjoyed it. I'm an enthusiast. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm good at it, uh, but but that kind of got me into into R and, and Python. I'd had some professors um, in uh, economics and, and classes like that talking about uh, especially R. So I kind of went down that path, and this was probably like 20... 14, 2015. So it was right at the time where I would say a lot of the power products were coming into shape, right? Like Power BI, uh, Power Query, all that kind of thing. So I kind of, uh, you know, went my own way in a bit, but it's it's nice. And I'm sure we'll talk about how they're all kind of coming back together, Python, Power BI and everything. But so I, I took a little detour into R and Python and that, but, you know, Excel's always been my home base. So that, that's really been been the, the reason for writing the book is that when I was learning things like Python and R, I didn't really see a good straightforward path. I mean, there's obviously a lot of material out there on learning those languages, uh, but it really was not well communicated for Excel people. If it was speaking to Excel people, it was usually pretty derogatory in, in that, you know, you shouldn't be using Excel and it's just not good. And... Uh, you know, we're going to get you out of it, almost like a good versus evil kind of thing, I say in the book. Um, and, and I really don't like that approach. It's just not factually accurate, for one thing. And it's just not it's not a good way to motivate your reader. If you're going to call them an idiot when they open the page, like that's just not not a great idea. Um, so so that was really the, the reason for the book. And um, it's it's been fun to have people talk about, yeah, like this is the this is the bridge that I needed to get into to things like this and to, to demystify what what something like Python is is for them. Okay, cool. So 
I'm glad that you brought that up because when we talked, remember I, I told you exactly this, that I'm so glad that someone actually is presenting other solutions, but in a way that they fit into the ecosystem, not yeah. uh, in a sense of, you know, that's rubbish, this is great. Because um, I, I just hate some Power BI people who are actually um, trying to talk about Power BI in a way of, you know, this is not Excel because Excel is, uh, you know, I'm not even going to say it, but uh, I, I just hate that. So this uh, this approach uh, by you, I, I remember telling you specifically that I love that, uh, exactly that approach. And, I, and I'm guessing if you if you start out, you know, using Excel, then that is sort of the approach you you got to say, because you got to love it, right? If you do yeah, exactly. data, you got to love Excel. <laughs> yeah, and, and I even saw this in a, a recent blog post by our studio, and this is something I've been saying for a while, is that a lot of trades will have some sort of wireframing or prototyping tool, right? So designers have that, engineers have that, and I see Excel as, as like that for, for data analysts, right? It's a great way to just quickly put something together, uh, share something with clients and just, you know, it, it's very tactile, right? You really see what's happening. So uh, it, it, having that prototyping and wireframing tool, I mean, people talk about the lean startup and minimum viable products and stuff like that all the time. But then when they get into data, it's like, oh no, you know, you need this really fancy, uh, you know, Python or Docker or whatever. And, and yeah, ultimately in production, things like that are great. But just to start out, just to share your ideas, I mean, there's really nothing better than Excel. And it's really interesting that you bring up that there could be some d divisions among even the the Microsoft stack users now with, with Power BI and Excel and that same yeah, dynamic. I mean, happening. I've heard MVPs, I've heard Power BI MVPs dissing Excel, and I, I hate it every time. Uh, and it's not just because, you know, I am a Power BI user, I'm an Excel user. I I realize both Excel, it's something, no pun intended, uh, but, you know, they're both useful. They're both extremely useful, and there is a big Power BI and Excel better together story. Um, and, and you know, I, I just don't think one should be dissing another product just because, you know, um, yeah, or to make really... yourself seem smarter or whatever. Yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe there's some insecurity there with, with the imposter <laughs> maybe. syndrome. And um, I, I think that what's really neat to, to be seeing is that there are all of these tools available to you as an analyst. And I've got a chapter about that in the book about uh, what I call the data analytics stack, right? You've got things like spreadsheets, you got databases, you've got all these BI tools, and this is a really rough way to categorize it, but it works. Um, and then you've got your programming languages like Python or R or something like that. And uh, what's really cool to see that, that there are so many more ways that you can start using these together. Like you mentioned Power BI and Excel, uh, Python and Excel, whatever is gonna happen there. Uh, you know, all these ways to, and, and really a lot of the, the best analytics products come from from combining them so seeing the strengths and weaknesses of each and knowing how to uh, really complement them together rather than substituting one for the other uh, so i'm hoping that over time as you know I, i'm sure that microsoft knows their products probably better than any of us do and as they continue to roll out more and more features that are really just showing you like you're meant to use these together and that that's a thing that that i I think I encounter a lot um, with people who are interested in my book. They'll ask, um, you know, hey, I'm learning Power Query or I'm learning DAX or whatever. Uh, why should I learn Python or R or something like that? And uh, my answer really is uh, Microsoft wants you to, right? I mean, look in the Power Query editor, right? There are ways to work with Python and, and R there. And uh, you really don't need to be an expert or do all of your work in Python. I'm, I'm really not uh, advocating that you just drop everything and use Python. But uh, if you just know enough that, that you can substitute, I mean, even Microsoft is seeing like, yeah, there are some things that Python and R does better. And we want to make that as accessible for you uh, as we can be so that you can use Python or R to build visualizations, maybe do a little bit more machine learning. And, and the fact that they're making it available free, right? I mean, uh, I think we can all agree. I'm going to 
ding Tableau a little bit. You have to pay to do this in Tableau. You have to pay to use R, which is an open source software. You need to be on a license. Power BI, it's free. So I think Microsoft, it's, it's really great to see their uh, embracing of open source things like Python and R. And and for, for my takeaway for readers is that, yeah, just to know the basics that it, it's going to be really beneficial for you, not to mention uh, whatever is going to happen, like I've said before, with, with Excel and Python, because that's a very popular topic right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Excel has come a really, uh, you know, a really long way in a in a short stretch of time now. I, I I can't even imagine how we did things in Excel before 2009, before Power Pivot, before Power Query, before all this, you know, um, sort of data awareness came to Excel. And a lot of times in Excel, I'll I'll look at users that are actually experts in Excel, but not necessarily experts in uh, just data analysis, right? The the depth to which they'll go will be the sum, the average, the or the mean, and you know the median in that is, uh, and then standard deviation is just something that a table does, You're not necessarily knowing what it is, um, and at, at before all this. Uh, big development in Excel happened and in Power BI, you really had to use R for some of the visualizations and things like that. And particularly R because it's mm. it was just built for that, right? It's that's yeah. the that's its purpose. And and recently Excel really um, has progressed in, in that sense. But let me play devil let me just play devil's advocate here. So we don't usually pick our favorite kid, but uh and and you know against everything we've said so far but if you had to pick only one tool to to do would it be excel would it be r or would it be python oh man that's really where, where do you feel most comfortable i guess is the question yeah so honestly i think it, the order in which I, I cover the tools in the book is a good learning path it was for me and i would say for, for others um so Excel is just such a good foundation. It's the best way to really understand what's happening, whether it's some model you're building or some statistical theorem. I've got some things in the book where you're building almost like a little app to understand something like the central limit theorem that maybe you heard in, in math class back in school, but you don't really understand. And you think, well, like, why is that even important if I'm a professional data analyst? Uh, so we do that in the book. And, and then I think that R is a great stepping stone for uh, Excel users because like you mentioned, it's it was really built to do uh, statistical analysis. So um, that sure. idea of having data in rows and columns is really how it was built. And, and I just find it a natural jumping off point. And, and to be honest, between R and Python, I find myself leaning often more toward R just because it does feel a little more intuitive as a data person. Um, that's not to say that Python is in, isn't useful and powerful. Um, it's really good if you're coming from a developer environment. I would probably say if you're coming from a VBA background where you're doing a lot of automation and development, building applications, that Python would maybe be a better option because that's really what it's good at. Um, yeah, because it's the but, whole thing, right? It's the whole package, whereas R is specific to analysis. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but I think <laughs> I, I kind of well, <laughs> skirted around it in different ways. Yeah, you did. Okay. So do you feel like we don't get enough Excel knowledge in school? Absolutely. Like I said, I really didn't get any of it as a student and i think that's changing i mean i've been in touch with my uh, alma mater and, and they've been very receptive and i've even come back and and taught little workshops and things like that um for r but um i would do excel at the same uh, it, it's been interesting to watch the development of high school and, and college education and, and how it treats things like excel and data literacy in in general like i said I wasn't really that great of a of a math student, and I'll admit I got a D in algebra one time, and that was the only D I ever got in school. 
Um, and I kind of wonder if, if things were taught the way they were uh, or the way that I'm doing it, maybe I would enjoy it because there were uh, things that I, I liked, you know, when it got to the more applied things, building models and things like that, um, that, that was something that, that interested me, but uh, that's just not the way that, that math is taught. Now, you know, I'm sure that there are True. good reasons for the learning things like algebra and geometry because, you know, a lot of what we do is based on that, right? Um, but I, I do wonder if maybe there's a way to include both of them uh, in the same way that, you know, maybe you go to college and you're learning literature or history or something like that and whatever, that's fine. But um, it's going to be hard to get a job after that. And I think that you can still get some benefit from a degree like that. And at the same time, learn enough about data and Excel to get that first job. Um, so I think for students in, in, in school and in, in primary school, there's probably a way to keep those fundamental things, understanding algebra, uh, calculus, stuff like that, and also getting a little more applied into something like Excel. Uh, as to how to do that, I, I don't know. People have asked me and I, I just don't know enough about school. I mean, I don't have any kids or, you know, I'm really not in that world. So it's hard for me to get real specific, but yeah, it is a need. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, there's so little uh, application to life, in, you know, in the way that it's taught in, in school. And I'm guessing that's the reason uh, why many of it of it just goes right past you, right? Um, because there's no application that you can see in real life, and, and that's one of the things I loved about your book, um, where where you sort of make the jump from, let's say, basic or descriptive statistics and or descriptive analytics in Excel, um, and you make the jump into, uh, you know, let's say higher statistics. Um, where you start with the probability and stuff, it's always based on an example. Um, and, I, and I love that, right? Because you can see that, you can kind of envision that. Um, uh, but I was wondering because still, you know, probably if you wanted to make it just step by step uh, kind of book, it would be war and peace, I guess, um, in a sense of the volume. Um, but it, it does make the leaps quite fast. So what would you say would be the perfect reader for your book? Or let me rephrase that. Um, how much knowledge would you say someone needs to have in a uh, in Excel so that your book uh, would be sort of the most useful for them? Yes, I have that. I have something in the book for that. If I can find it, uh, the prerequisites. Let me see. If it's uh, okay. I think I talk about okay. Uh, absolute, relative, and mixed cell references. And this is uh, page ten of the preface. Uh, conditional logic and conditional aggregation. So if statements, some if, some ifs. Combining data sources. So I have VLOOKUP in here. And to be honest, in the book. I really don't get to use a lot of the new tools like uh, uh, dynamic arrays and X lookup and things like that because I just know I don't know what version people are on. So just to be safe, I figured I'm gonna I, like for example I used um, Rand between. I didn't use Rand array. I really wanted to, but you know just in case somebody doesn't have it. Uh, so yeah, so V lookup, index match, sorting, filtering, pivot. So knowing pivot tables. Uh, that that's a big leap. So I'm saying like, yeah, you need to know VLOOKUP and you need to know pivot tables. Not everybody does. So I, I have a re reference in here to read the Excel 2019 Bible. So that is uh, Mike Alexander's book and uh, basic plotting. So, you know, knowing how to make a line chart and things like that. Now, uh, you know, for somebody like you or me, it's easy to look at that and be like, oh yeah, you know, whatever. I know that I'll, I'll move on. But I do get a fair amount of emails and questions from people asking, you know, what do I need to know? Uh, what should I do first? Because, you know, hey, I, I do want to learn Python or R. I do want to get into analytics, but um, I'm not comfortable with a pivot table or something like that. And the, th the thing I like about the Excel 2019 Bible is it is the war and peace, like you mentioned. It is, it's, a, it's a big, it's a yeah. big stack. Um, but it is, I think, the the prerequisite knowledge. Now, that got me thinking, now that you mentioned that, what does somebody need to know? Um, because I was focused on the Excel part of it. Um, 
you know, what sort of mathematical principles might they need to know? And that's something I really didn't consider. But um, I would say if you have a basic knowledge of what, what an average is, if you're able to differentiate between, um, you know, like a sum versus a count and all those things that you do in a pivot table, if you're, if you're comfortable with all the different aggregations that a pivot table can make and what they mean, I think you would be in, in pretty good shape to, to complete the book. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what sort of background would be relevant for that. I, I think it's more about the way of thinking because once That's you true, start yeah. using tables in Excel and once you start using pivot tables and VLOOKUP, I guess, um, that is when you really start thinking about Excel as rows and columns. And it's it's only that, that kind of thinking that gets you into data and analytics, right? When When a column is an entity, when the column is a field and you can do stuff with it. Um, whereas when you're only filling in cells, um, that is not really, you know, data analysis as such. Um, so I think I think that's fair saying they need to use pivot tables, but I think it's more about they need to be thinking about data in a sense of columns, of fields, of entities. Um, yeah, that's a good point because I do start the, the book with, discussing tables and really using that as a as a touch point into R and, and Python and um, yeah thinking about rows and columns and and knowing how data is clean right I mean that's so much of the problem and that's so much of what we oh, do that's, that's 50 percent of the problem exactly yeah yeah having yeah. that intuition for for what makes clean data because it's often pretty counterintuitive, right? To someone who doesn't work with, with data and analyzing data, what you see might look good to you, but not to a computer. So knowing that difference is is really important. So yeah, I guess that would be another good thing to, to have down before getting into the book. Cool. So do you prefer showing results as numbers or as plots? Yeah, that's a good distinction. Um, I think who, oh, is it, I think it's Stephen Fewer, Edward Tuft, one of those, one of those guys has a guide on when to use a table versus a visualization. And um, I, I try to start with uh, when in doubt, visualizing things just for my own sake, it's, it's useful. Um, you know, so the the problem is that you've got, and I think this does go into to data literacy, and it's such a fascinating topic to get into because you know a lot of managers and your audience uh, isn't really comfortable with with the visualization. We we always talk about uh, okay, that's a great way to bring people together, and regardless of someone's technical ability. Uh, a visualization is just that's the way that humans like to process information visually. Um, the, the issue is that you know, so many people just want that exact number. They don't really feel comfortable. I mean, visualizations are very abstract, right? And uh, if you're a business person, you tend to really want something concrete. So you want the exact figure and you want to see on the plot what what each data point is. You know, you want all these labels and you and then all you end up basically just going back to the source data, right? Like I've had so many conversations with uh, with business people where I'll give them some reporter analysis and we keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And then really what they what they want is just to look at everything row by row and, and analyze it. So so it's a it's a difficult uh, thing to make. But I think that, yeah, trying to lean on on that visual power is, is great. But there are cases where, you know, if you have a single KPI, uh, if you have something that it, you need to be really precise on, then yeah, adding those uh, adding those numbers. But you know, try not to go what like I'd say maybe maybe a three by three table is probably the most you want to get into because the other thing too is uh, you know if you're going to be projecting something. Back when we had meetings and people got together and worked, and you had to put things. <laughs> Remember on a, those days? <laughs> yeah, and you had to put things on a slide. It, it could start to get pretty difficult if you got more than more than that that number of uh, of figures. So yeah, it's an interesting uh, you know debate on how to do that, and that would be a good blog post to try to give my own interpretation on when to use a table or a graph. Yeah, because it's 
I don't know when this started, but it was popular about five years ago. It was like data storytelling, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And and what that in the end was like you take the chart as it was 12 months and everything, but then you gray 11 months out, except for the month that you're really trying to focus on and then create only that one green or red, depending on what you're trying to say and all that. Um, and, you know, lose the, uh, the axis labels because you can put the numbers straight on the, uh, on the columns and then you don't need the labels on the other columns, just on the one that's actually important. And, and I was always, when I was reading that, I, I was always thinking, you've totally committed to that visualization. This could never go back into a table because if this was a table now, it would just be all blanks and just one cell would be full, uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I thought about that too. And the sense in which you get these these charts and you're right, they're not really traceable back to anything. Yeah, you can't you can't go back from that, right? It, but it it is in a sense that it's trying to tell a story. That's what it does. But then again, you know, sometimes you need all of the data to to tell a story, right? Because this is telling a story as one person decided that the story should be told. Yeah, that that's that's a good point too. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, risk involved, not even uh, just intentional, but uh, when you're making those changes to the chart and kind of manually adjusting things, and uh, we've seen how how badly things can go when there's that kind of uh, manual, not really traceable uh, audit done to to a chart or something like that. So yeah, the the, the storytelling with data uh, area. Uh, I don't talk a lot about that in in the book. Um, I, I am working on a little bit more content about that, but um, you know, I, I tend to approach it a little differently, and and always trying to to draw things back to um, some sort of statistical principle, uh, trying to confirm those insights via um, things like inferential statistics and things like that. Now, depending on the the audience and the the data and things like that, it, that's not always a relevant indicator. But that's another thing that I do enjoy about getting into uh, R and, and Python and things like that. Um, is that that I find a lot of the the BI tools just very limited with that. Um, you know, it's great for exploring data and uh, some of the things that Power BI is coming up with to dig, drill into variances and, uh, you know, say, hey, I want to see sales by quarter. So, yeah, just type it and there's your answer. Stuff like that is great. But um, I tend to be a little more cautious of letting the computer do too much of your thinking or, um, you know, kind of doing things your own way. And, and, and on the other hand, I guess not having the computer give it say it as well and not letting your your work be reproducible um so there yeah so many areas that's really interesting it's almost like uh, we talk about ai and then we talk about storytelling with data and uh, it seems like in all, any of these senses it's kind of the difference between what what you're doing versus what the computer's doing and, and how you're kind of tracing that relationship over time um we're getting pre pretty theoretical but that's okay with me i hope your audience is okay too well, i mean <laughs> I think we've sort of opened this perfectly for the next question, which would be, what are your thoughts on ML and AI and the future of data analytics with those tools? Yeah, that's that's a great one um, because, like I mentioned, there are increasingly more opportunities to work with AI in something like Power BI and not necessarily develop yourself, but use it to guide your your decisions. And uh, for some things, I don't see a problem with it. Like I said, building a chart uh, and just getting the start to it and being able to use natural language to say, you know, hey, what was what was the sale in January or something like that? I mean, that's great. That saves a lot of time. That That's just uh, very productive. Uh, but when it comes to really understanding why and and uh, making the, the right decision, I don't know. I mean, there's some benefits to things like AI and ML. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I definitely tend to be more on the um, like old school statistics, kind of understanding why and really making it clear, making things interpretable. 
uh, I think that that's really the Achilles heel, I think, of a lot of this AI and ML is that nobody knows what's happening under the hood, right? There's really no way to audit it. And they're working on ways to do it, but it's still still a weak point. Um, the, the other thing that I think that gets into is a lot of these low code and no code tools, right? You, you often hear that uh, these all these technical skills aren't gonna matter because we're gonna have all of these new ways to, to work with data and you're not gonna need to be a technical expert. And I'm also pretty skeptical of that too, because I've seen, uh, you know, over the years we've had this kind of battle between a graphical user interface and, and code, right? So even something like VBA versus the macro recorder, right? You're able to generate VBA code. You really can't do everything with the macro recorder. It's just to kind of like help you get into that zone. Maybe you learn a little bit, help you with a few tasks. Uh, I think M and Power Query is very similar, right? You have all these menu options, but a lot of the time you need to customize that code yourself. So, you know, True. like the, the GUI is a good starting point, but it's not, it's not everything. So, I think that's just the same, it's the same cycle repeating itself. I think with a lot, you know, low code and no code, I think when people talk about that, they're just talking about a GUI and that's really not anything revolutionary. I mean, maybe they're talking about a GUI that has AI features, which is a little different. Um, and, and I can see some benefits to that, but I, I don't think that saying, oh, you know, don't learn anything about Python, you know, don't learn how functions work or something like that is is very, very good advice because they're always going to be there's going to be some need to audit whatever that GUI is doing, customize it. Um, you know, maybe there are ways I mean, there uh, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with something like uh, virtual reality or augmented reality. And I just saw an article about that how people are starting to use that for uh, corporate reporting. And so maybe there are ways that we're going to move beyond just, you know, sitting at a keyboard to have to work with data. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, I don't think anybody has the crystal ball to know how that's going to work out. In the meantime, we found that technical know-how is, is pretty valuable. So um, it's, it's worth knowing a little bit. And um, there are just a lot of there's a lot of prognostication, right? I think there's a lot of marketing and um, it's, it's, it's easy to get swept away and what the next big thing might be. But, you know, Excel has been pretty proven to work. In technological years, it's, it's, it's established itself. It's, it's not going anywhere. And we see Microsoft putting more and more resources into Excel. So uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, worth, worth dropping to learn. Oh, no. And yeah. I mean, Sometimes it's even when you're trying to make things accessible, it's actually bad, bad marketing in the end, like like Power BI. I, in the beginning, it was kind of a now everyone that has five minutes can create their own reports. And whereas that could be actually true, you can do something in five minutes, but if you're only doing it in a sense of I'll drag this, I'll put this in, I'll do this, um, and not understanding the things, it's it, it's just going to lead to you know big heartaches. Um, like Excel, if you don't know what you're doing in Excel, you can get the numbers that can be very very wrong, and that can have serious consequences. And even with ML or AI, if you're doing like a forecast, right? And and it throws some forecast out just with a push of one button. I don't think that's actually usable. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Because mm -hmm. it even has like, it has check boxes, right? Is it seasonal? Is it that? But if you don't know what that means, if you don't know how that changes your uh, forecast, then it's it's probably, you know, kind of useless for or or actually can even have bad consequences in the sense that you can say oh my god next year we're gonna have 20 percent growth uh, yeah it's an interesting discussion because uh we we talk about not wanting to rely on the computer for for everything like that and generating a forecast we want to have more comfort with it uh, but then we look at, well, do we want to go back to the time? And, and I've, I've heard people talk about wanting to run a, a linear regression and having to go to the mainframe and spending all day getting it ready. And then maybe there's like one thing you want to change and that's a whole other day. And it would take a whole team of people just to run a simple regression. Um, 
I'm not thinking, you know, I don't want to go back to pen and paper or uh, going back to a mainframe or anything like that. But uh, at the same time, I really don't want to get into something like that where, yeah, you're just clicking a button to to do a forecast. So I think there is some danger to that. So so where the happy middle to it is, uh, honestly, I think something like Python or R where, you know, there's a fair amount of abstraction. You're not having to do assembly code or something like that. Uh, at the same time, you're not just kind of uh, blindly relying on on the computer to know what it's doing. So I think there is a spectrum uh, within, you know, between abstraction and and uh, automation and things like that. And and honestly, I think something like uh, the tools that we're talking about, Excel, Python, R, you know, there's are some cases for uh, some of that embedded AI that that's helpful. I think for that data exploration is good. Uh, but when it comes to taking that next step, like making predictions. Uh, really understanding why what's happening uh, happened. Uh, you need to know a little bit more than than just a uh, click of the button sort of work. Yeah, true. And I, and I think your book is brilliant for that to, you know, to sort of dip your your toes into the water of R and Python. And particularly because it's going to be more and more important, I think, for for data analysts to to have this different tools. Uh, so let me ask you now, uh, this is your world. The data just lives in it. I, oh, I, yeah, love, yeah. That, I love that statement and, and I'm guessing you do too, right? Cause it's one of the, it's even the chapter title, I think in the, in the book. So tell me how that one came to be. Yeah, I think I, I saw something about, it was, uh, like a YouTube comment that, uh, it's, it's so and so's world. Uh, we're all just living in it, or something like that, to describe some character. And I thought, oh, that's kind of funny. And and that I I used in one of the examples where, uh, when we're doing something like inferential statistics, and the results give us one thing, you're in control ultimately, right? I mean, all these things, the data, the tools, the statistics really just meant to help you. I mean, really, you should be kind of commanding what's happening with the data. The data isn't supposed to be commanding you to what to do. So uh, you need to have that, uh, talk about business context, understanding what's really going to help you, and and remembering that the data, you know, it's just an abstraction of, of what has happened, right? Those are just symbols and uh, measurements and, and things like that of uh, an outside reality, right? Like we're the ones that are living in the reality and doing things. The data is just there to to help us along with that. So so that's why I use that in in the book. And um, did you get the sticker? Or I think I had a magnet or something. There's some other marketing material that that I have with that slogan too. Yeah. Is it a is it a coaster? Uh, I know. I think that one just has the logo. I think I have a magnet. Oh. Maybe I didn't send the magnet to you because I didn't know if it would get through customs or something. Uh, yeah, I didn't but, get the magnet. Okay, I'll send you the. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a PDF <laughs> of it then. How, how's that? Cool. Yeah. Cool. No, I love. I mean, I love that statement. It's kind of what what it reminded me of is um, when when I was really uh, into our forecasting. Oh, right? and yeah. and trying to really create a algorithm that would that would be brilliant uh, you know and always getting stuck on meeting with the ceo uh, if if the, they were really hands on with the company and a ceo would always beat my forecast cuz they would just you know mm. they would know what's going to happen and my forecast didn't cuz the past didn't tell it what's going to happen in the next 3 months and and I always love that, right? Because it's our world. We actually have a uh, understanding. Even if we look at no data, we seem to have an understanding what's happening with that company, right? What's um, it, it's true that sometimes you need some context. Like if you're growing five percent year over year every year, you're thinking you're doing great, but then you realize that in the same uh, that your competition is actually growing ten percent, then that's bad. Um, but but in this sense, I really kind of uh, just thinking of that CEO that says, "Oh, that that number, that three months, that's not going to go," and it really didn't go. And I was, uh, it, it reminded me of that just so brilliantly, you know, uh, that that's uh, the data is just there to help you, but it's never going to be, 
you know, the, the total one and only truth, right? Yeah, that's a good example because it, it's also there's something to be said for making your making you document what what you think. So that's one of the great things of building something like a financial model or a forecast is, you know, you might have an idea of what the growth is going to be or uh, what your interest rates going to be or whatever. Uh, but then actually putting that it's just like anything else, actually putting that on a piece of paper really forces you to think through like why and trace through those assumptions. So I think there's something to be said for, you know, building these models and, and this data is that it really makes you uh, put some stake into what you're thinking and they actually make you, you know, think through why, why you think that. And the other thing with that, this idea of, uh, you know, you're just, uh, the data is just living in your world is, um, I've been in plenty of jobs where I would spend all day on just tedious Excel reporting and uh, I wasn't really understanding the business, didn't really have time to understand uh, like what we were selling or why or what the business model was or anything like that. And uh, that it, it's not great, right? There, there's some extent to which you, you really need to get out of the building and to, to put a famous expression there and understand the, the bigger context of, of your data or your business, I mean. And you know, the better you can get at automating things, building clean forecasts, cleaning your data quickly, that is just gonna open you up to getting to that next level of, of understanding the business. And that's gonna help you with your data more too. So there's a nice virtuous cycle that, that goes into that. And that's really a big reason of why I got into what I'm doing is because I just thought, uh, you know, if I'm in my cubicle crunching out reports all day, this isn't going to lead to anything. And this is, is this even helping? I don't, I don't see why, you know, I want to, I want to get really good at Excel so I can have that command over my data so that I'm at, so that I am able to talk to people in different departments and understand what they're doing and, and understand the economics of the industry and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Cause I, I'll probably say the same when when I'm so often it happens to me when I'm with a client and they want to hire me for something I always and it's something abstract like something I've never done before um, I always say well I'm gonna need someone on your side too someone that really knows what those numbers mean because I can give you the numbers but I'm not gonna even know if they're correct yeah, absolutely yeah okay so are you thinking about part two of the book I am thinking about writing more. I enjoy the the writing process, and I, I see the the path of what I would want to do. I almost think of a I can think of a sequel, and I can think of a prequel as well. So, uh, wh which one I decide on is is I'm not sure yet. I am working on some more content related, and I think I'll do a course or maybe some blog posts or something like that that take you to the next level because you know there's only so much you can get to in one book. I didn't really talk yeah. about things like uh, learning GitHub, learning a little bit more of machine learning, uh, getting into stuff like Power BI and using Python and R inside of that, using Python or R to automate what you do but, in Excel. But that's what I said. If you would have included all that, it would be you know this thick. You exactly. You simply can't do that. Yeah, and, and uh, even some of the more advanced things, you know, how to handle an outlier, how to handle a missing value, all that kind of stuff that gets into more advanced data cleaning. I, I didn't I didn't get into that. So there's so many ways that that I can can dive into it and and I am figuring out how to how to do that. So stay tuned. But cool. yeah, there's there is a lot once you think about how many ways to get into all the things that people want to know and really my goal i think is that idea of being that that full stack analyst and and knowing knowing python knowing excel knowing uh databases uh learning about power bi and, and seeing how to use all of them together and see how they all have their part in in doing data analytics so i think that's going to be a goal of wherever i go next with the book so what would the prequel be yeah, I think the prequel would be more of a, a introduction to, I, I guess you would call it data literacy, uh, but really more. Oh, okay, walking. I get you. I get yeah, you. Yeah, okay. probably in Excel and and learning the, learning all the steps, and that's another thing I I couldn't really get into is, how do you how do you decide what data to use? How do you collect it? What 
business problem is there? And then how do you communicate your findings? Should I put things in a chart or a table? Things like that. So more of a generalist view of using Excel in a context of data analysis. And then from there, getting more into statistics and Python and, and, and topics like that. Okay, because even the, um, just the cleaning of data would require probably half of the book. That's true. If, yeah, if and, you really you know, got into it, right? And then try to make uh, sense of it. Yeah, a lot of books don't even teach data cleaning because it's hard to do. Every time you clean data, True. it's a little different, and it's really hard to bring that into a, an artificial setting. And I applaud authors who actually take that on. I saw that Oz Dussolet is working on a new edition of Guerrilla Data Analysis, and that was one of my first books where I saw, wow, people are actually thinking through how to clean data. This is great because I thought I was the only person who cared about doing this right. So, you know, authors who really tackle that head on, I definitely respect because it's it's easy enough to to write a book and want to get into all the cool, exciting stuff, right? When people think about becoming a data professional, they're probably thinking about building some cool model or a dashboard and making all this pretty stuff that you can hand to a boss. But yeah, really, you can't you get, do anything if your data is not a clean. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I really, true. I really applaud the authors who. Uh, in a in a sense, it it really bursts the bubble of a lot of people who say, "Oh, I want to be a, a data person," and then you find, "Oh my God, I have to spend how many <laughs> hours just to get my data so I can do all the cool stuff." So uh, it, it's not exactly a, a great marketing point for everybody, but the really good people can get you excited about about that. And I think Oz is really good about that, getting people actually excited about cleaning data rather than just running away from it. True, true. I've been I've been to many conferences and uh, me and Oz were the speakers and uh, yeah, I've seen him in action and that he does that. He he connects to to people with exactly that, you know, real life stories. But I think there's a lot of us that um, that's why a lot of us say that Power Query is probably the most important thing that happened in Excel recently. Um, and recently is saying 2013. Um, it's just because it actually enables you to do that, to automate your cleanup, to you know, um, to to realize it needs cleaning because it will return an error if you try to uh, format it as a date and it's not even a number, right? Um, and, and and even what I think Power Query is guilty of is even making people understand that VLOOKUP wasn't perfect, which we all knew that that's that was why the whole VLOOKUP versus index match thing was happening. But even that, you know, it, it was never perfect, whereas Power Query being perfect actually made it a problem for some people because they didn't understand how can they get 30 rows when they started with 10 uh -huh. and, and did the VLOOKUP, right? Um, so I think that's... Uh, that's very important, and I think that Power Query was a big, big step, um, and it probably should have been vice versa because Power Pivot was before Power Query, but Power Pivot is already data modeling. But if your data is not okay, you know. Yeah, you're no... absolutely right. I remember. <laughs> Why I remember would you build a model spent. from it? And and I think Power Query was exactly the the thing that was that was missing. So do you do a lot of Power Query? I do a little. I'm thinking of adding more uh, to whatever if I do a course or some blog post or whatever with it. And it, it's great for like what you're mentioning, uh, profiling data and cleaning it. And, and I really like it. It's such a good mix of uh, automating things, but also making it auditable, right? You're able to see all the steps. You're able to edit those steps you're able to kind of look at the data still and, and visualize it and all that. So I have a lot of a lot of respect for for Power Query as well. And that's one of the other thing I try to put uh, in a good light is that, you know, when people ask me, hey, should I learn Python or Power Query or whatever? And I know you've only got everybody can only learn so many things. So right. I mean, really, my answer is just try them out, right? Just yeah, check out and Power see what Query. fits to whatever you're doing. 
yeah, whatever, whatever you enjoy more, whatever is a better setup for, for your work or whatever project you're on. And uh, that's probably a better way than just kind of cut and dry. Like you should learn X or, or Y, right? There, there's always, there's so many, like we know we're data people. They're always, they're always, there's so many variables. There's so much, so much context. True. It's, it's hard yeah. to just have a one, one and done answer to things like that. Yeah. But I mean, with Power Query, really, usually people would compare it to VBA, like automating stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And and I would always say, uh, when they would ask me what's the difference, I would say, well, look, in Power Query, if something goes wrong, you just go through the steps and you see exactly which step, you know, went wrong and you see exactly why. Uh, whereas in VBA, it will still take you to a line of code that went, where everything went wrong, but usually that wouldn't be the most helpful thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I am a true, you know, Power Query fan. Uh, always have been. So what's next for George? It's a good one. Uh, I think it will be like we mentioned some some sort of book. I, I'm certainly excited to to keep writing and getting more into this idea of, of data literacy and helping organizations with the resources that that I wish I had had when when I started out as an analyst. There are so many companies starting formal data literacy programs or bringing in more more training and development resources for people to to get better at data and and thinking through what that means for all sorts of levels so the the, the managers that you mentioned who may have a good intuitive grasp of the business and are skeptical of getting into data because they think that you know they have a better grasp anyway and they they might but there are ways that that learning some analytics is still going to be helpful yeah. uh, helping people like me who have some strengths from maybe they learned a little bit of uh statistics in school but the stuff you do in school is just way different than what you do in the workforce so so helping them through those and i think a lot of organizations have a lot more talent than they realize and i've i've seen too many companies say we need to get better at data and then they'll go and hire some crack team of PhD data scientists and they think that that's just going to solve the problem right and and they get bored because the the infrastructure is just not ready for them to do what they do and then they leave and they're you know that's very expensive to have PhD data scientists to be turning over for your business it would be a much better idea to take the talent that you have, the people who are really in the trenches with your data, understand your business, and just putting that development into helping them learn these tools. You know, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to get some good stuff out of Python and R, and or all the tools we talked about, Power BI, Power Query. I mean, there's so much stuff at at people's disposal. How many? And that's the old thing we you know, the Excel experts talk about. How many Excel users still have no idea what Power Query is? Uh, so just think of all the all the resource and opportunity there to to help people with that. So so that's really what what I'm focused on is, is getting getting organizations to that point where they really have a clear roadmap for getting better at at analytics. Cool, that's a noble goal, and I really think that this book can really do it. So, uh, really, kudos for this. Uh, I so loved much, it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, I'm glad I got to you. I know that uh, <laughs> I had to send it, and I am getting better at at shipping these books because people want signed copies, like you, and and yeah, they usually although, get theirs. This is the Slovenian post office. I don't know if it shows, but this is all wrinkled here. Uh, okay. I was really upset with that. But uh, yeah, man, thank you, thank you. I, I already had the Kindle version. But this oh, that's funny. Yeah, it, it, it's great because I have a library of this uh, oh, that, books yeah. I really love, and um, this one's gonna fit right there. Thank you. And just for the last question, will there be a Power BI and R and Python book? Well, I know there's one on the market now by Ryan Wade. That's pretty good. I saw one. That's coming soon by Luca somebody, and that looks pretty good. Another MVP. I I just connected with with Luca, 
Okay. Uh, as for me, I think, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do a book. I'd like to do something. I'm, I'm a tech editor right now of a book getting into AI powered business intelligence in Power BI. So that's kind of a related topic. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to write the book myself, but I'm certainly kind of in that sphere. And like I said, I might do some, uh, some sort of like a video course or maybe some webinars or something like that with it. The other thing that I've been getting into more is that, and that's actually what, what am I going to do next? I think uh, is that Python and Excel alleged integration. We don't know oh, for shit. sure. At least I don't no, because I'm not knows. an MVP, <laughs> but uh, that that's, I think another thing that I'm hoping to be ready for for when that happens and you know if your readers are looking for other books there's a one that came out i don't know did you read python for excel the book yeah yeah no okay i yeah, was so it's um oh i'm not gonna remember the name and he's gonna hate me for it um so do you know the oh is it pi 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 Oh my God! Oh, the the package. Uh, the Tony, the Tony, no, uh, Tony that does uh, that does Python in Excel. Um, he's probably most famous for Python and Excel integrations and uses. Um, and and uh, he was always my go-to resource for that. Um, I met him I think about four years ago when we were speaking at a conference in London. Uh, it was about development in Excel and I had Power Query stuff. Um, Charles Williams had VBA and there was a lot of others. There was Excel DNA and all that um, covered and he had Python and, um, you know, Python being a full blown language is just, it's so powerful. It can really do amazing stuff. And I think if it happens that that connects to Excel, that will be a brilliant partnership. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm trying to to be well positioned for for whatever happens there. Uh, Python for Excel is uh, Felix Zumstein's book. It's another O'Reilly title. Okay. I was a tech reviewer on that. It's it's good. I mean, it came out at the the same time almost. And uh, Felix's book is more, I guess, more on the development and automation side. Uh, okay. and, and showing you, you know, maybe how, if you have a VBA module, how to call it from Python, how to connect to a database in in Python, and and sync that up with Excel. So it's more about that kind of uh, development application thing. Uh, whereas my book gets into more of the statistical modeling and analytics. So uh, you know, they're they're pretty good bookends, right? Like I would hope if people read one, they would want to pick up the other. And uh, I know that that Felix and Excel Wings is his package. They're doing a lot with with this kind of stuff as well. Although there it's, the 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 sort order should be your book first, right? Because it's kind of a build up to then doing I, amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know Felix's is good if you've worked with VBA in the past. You don't necessarily need to have, but I think it, it's good context. And if you're if you're learning to if if you know maybe you have some kind of a report or whatever product you need to deliver on a regular basis, what Python can do for you. But uh, if you wanted to get into uh, statistical modeling, I mean, I think that even if you're not dealing with p values or running regressions or doing that kind of uh, statistics work, you should still know about it because it's just part of everything that we do. I mean, machine learning and, and data science really power so much of our world now. And just understanding the basics of what it can and can't tell you and starting yeah. with those basics like the central limit theorem, what is a p-value? I mean, these are simple things, but honestly, I've talked to people who have been studying AI for, for a while and they can't tell you that sort of thing. So I'm a big fan of getting those basics down, like really understanding the fundamentals even if you're not using it in, in your job, uh, there's going to be a point at which you'll need to interpret stuff like that. So yeah, there, Python for Excel is, is a good one too, and, and mine is as well. And like you said, there's so many books coming out. I, I don't know what my yeah. contribution is going to be next, but yeah, they're like you're seeing there's so many roads to go down. True, true. So where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, that's great. So uh, I have a, a blog. It's uh, stringfestanalytics.com. I'm sure we can put that in the notes because it, it's a little hard to spell, uh, but but that's the best way to get in touch with me. 
Uh, you can find, if you go to the site, I'll have a, up on the menu page, there's a place to learn more about the book as well. And I update the, the blog post regularly. So if you want to check that out, I've got a uh, 30 days to data analyst checklist. If you sign up for my blog, I'll send you a, a calendar almost where every day is just an activity that you do to learn a bit more about Excel, SQL, R, Tableau, I think are the ones because not everybody is on a uh, window. So I did Tableau. That's OK. Uh, so so you can learn a little more about about that if you sign up and, and you'll get some some information about the book as well. So so my blog is probably the best way, but I'm pretty active on LinkedIn as well if you want to find me there, too. OK, and and people can also book you like I did. That is true. Yeah, I have a calendar page. I, I keep that open. I try to be as accessible as, as I can for, for everybody. So, Cool, cool. And that will help with your, uh, you know, ultimate goal of helping people. Yes, yeah, that is, you, you, you have to enjoy discussing this stuff if uh, you want to do what, what we're doing. And I think I enjoy it and, and I've had a good conversation here as well. So thanks for yeah. advancing that goal. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, George. Thanks for doing this. And I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Gasper. I think I said that right. Yeah, yeah, it was right. <laughs>